Hey, I'm Dr. Taylor Petrie, and you're listening to Gospel Tangents. It's the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bat. I'm excited to introduce Dr. Taylor Petrie from Kalamazoo College, which is harder to say than it looks. We're going to talk to him about his fantastic new book, Tabernacles of Clay, and we're going to talk about how LDS rhetoric has changed from the 1950s to the present day with regards to interracial marriage. Do you think there might be changes similar with LGBT marriage? We'll talk about that in our next conversation. You don't want to miss it. Before we get there, I want you to know that I'm giving away a free copy of Taylor's book, Tabernacles of Clay. So if you're interested in this copy right here, sign up on our website at gospeltangents.com slash Petrie, and that's P-E-T-R-E-Y, and you'll be entered in a drawing to win a copy of this book right here. So uh, I will do that drawing after episode three, and uh, so make sure you get in within the next week or so, or it'll be too late. So... Uh, once again, sign up at uh, gospeltangents.com slash Petrie, P-E-T-R-E-Y, and you can win this book right here. So sign up today. Now back to our conversation. All right. Welcome to Gospel Tangents. I'm excited to have an amazing Harvard-trained historian. I think you're my first. I don't think I've ever talked to anybody from Harvard, but could you go ahead and tell us who you are? Sure. I'm uh, Dr. Taylor Petrie. I'm a professor at Kalamazoo College of Religious Studies, and uh, yeah, I was got my graduate degrees at Harvard, and uh, so that's that's that backstory, I guess. And um, yeah, that's that's the basics. Did, did you pack your car at Harvard Yard? <laughs> Many times, yes. <laughs> <laughs> got so lots I of tickets like, too. <laughs> I would like to get a little bit more of your background. Um, I understand. Well, I know you got your your PhD is a divinity degree or something like that. Yeah, so uh, the divinity school is one of the schools, like the law school and the medical school and so on at Harvard. The divinity school has been around for a couple of hundred years now, and um, it uh, was was originally developed to train ministers, but of course, uh, which it still does. But of course, uh, also has an academic mission as well, and so that's where the sort of seat of religious studies is at, at Harvard is is there. So that's where my um, uh, uh, master's and doctoral uh, degrees are both from. Oh, that's cool. So you got your master's and doctorate there. Now, are you a Red Sox fan? You know, I went to lots of Red Sox games, um, but I stopped caring about sports a long time ago. So. Oh. <laughs> oh. That hurts my yeah. heart. I tried. I really. I once I bought a TV and I was like, I'm gonna get into sports and I'm gonna care about sports. And about a third of a way through a football game, I was like, this is as boring as I remember it was. So I. <laughs> oh so, so you're not a Tom, well, Tom Brady. We can't talk about him. He's gone now. I don't. And I haven't gotten on board. But we got Cam Newton now on the Patriots. So. It was fun living in Boston for I was there for a decade when they won the Stanley Cup, the World Series and the uh, Super Bowls, you know, just constantly during that decade. So there was always a party going on. It was it was a fun time. It was a great decade. It's been a great decade and we can kiss 1918 goodbye. So it's good. (laughs) (laughs) You know, 1918 was when they had that darn pandemic, too. And you this is my first uh, remote interview. um, So. uh, I don't know if I like this, but we're going to we're going to try it anyway. So so before that, did you go to BYU or anything? Where did you get your bachelor's? I grew up in Utah, but I ended up going to New York City to Pace University for my undergraduate degree. So um, I then went on a mission and, and came back and started studying religion there and just fell in love with the discipline and figured that this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. Oh, wow. That's awesome. What was your bachelor's in? Philosophy and religious studies. Oh wow! So you're just all all in there. That's that's pretty cool. <laughs> so Taylor, one of the interesting things um, that about our relationship is we've 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 teamed up with the Dialogue Podcast Network. So can you talk about a little bit about your time as editor of Dialogue and and uh, and how we teamed how we got together, both of us? Yeah, I started the Dialogue Podcast Network not long after I became the editor of Dialogue because I really wanted to get a number of great shows that were out there like yours into a kind of single collective where we could all promote and talk about each other's shows. And and so the Dialogue Podcast Network emerged as sort of this group of uh, thoughtful and interesting, diverse voices uh, that are, that were working in, in Mormon uh, 
themed podcasting. And I was really excited to have you join that uh, w- and work with us to to kind of, you know, work with all of these other shows that, that have such great things to say about uh, Mormon history, about contemporary issues, about uh, gospel doctrine teachings and, and uh, all kinds of different stuff. So, yeah. So thanks for being a part of that. Yeah, well, it's been fun. Um, so just for those of you who aren't familiar with it, um, it's a, kind of a lot like Patreon in a way. They're, they're, it's more of towards educational sort of a thing. So um, the the website is is uh, Lyceum, L-Y, I hate spelling it, L-Y-C-E-U-M dot F-M. And um, you can subscribe to the Dialogue Podcast Network. So Gospel Tangents is in there. Um, Mormon News Report is in there. And so the nice thing is, you know, some of us only post once a week. I try to post about two or three times a week. And so if you're really into Mormon-themed podcasts you can go to one place and you can you can get everybody um and and it's you don't have to wait a whole week for the next episode or or three days or or whatever it is so uh it's it's updated quite a lot so it's been fun to to be on there um and how how did you get hooked up with with lyceum do you can you tell that story yeah, one of our board members is uh, uh, works with Lyceum and works in podcasting, and so we really wanted to leverage the sort of resources that he had to offer us, and so um, it just seemed to be a great fit and a great platform for the kind of work that we did. Uh, a lot of great benefits for members who join uh, with uh, direct contact with the shows and with uh, other uh, early content as you do, and and sometimes there are some bonus episodes for other for other shows that only subscribers get. So uh, so it just seemed to have a lot of the features that we were looking looking for and it was a great way to um you know to continue to create the community of podcast listeners that are out there yeah so it, it's free to listen uh, you know i'll post my episodes there as well as, as on my podcast um but you'll also get um uh, mormon news report and uh beyond the block and, and some other things like that and then, of course dialogue i know you've had some sunday school classes on there as well mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so uh so it's fantastic so, uh, well, that's awesome. Well, I've got your book here. Oh, Tabernacles boy. of Clay. There it is. I've read the whole thing. Oh my so the, this is okay. funny because I have to tell you, um, I think you hit all of the uh, hot button topics uh, in our, uh, our thing here because you talk about blacks, feminists, and and gays and i'm like wow you you kind of hit the trifecta there didn't you <laughs> thought you know sorry i had to get my dog who was scratching at the door i think rather than uh make him scratch the whole time i figured i'd bring him in um yeah i i wanted to bring those three things into conversation for a couple of reasons first that that is sort of the um uh, the the broader trends of the field of what we call intersectional intersectionality of sort of thinking about the interrelationship between these various categories of identity. And also I was just seeing it in the sources themselves that these things were overlapping and that they they needed to be put into conversation. Whereas we've had the history of race, we have LGBT histories, and we have um, the histories of, of women. I thought, you know, we really need to tell these stories as a sort of single story. The same characters are involved in all of them, you know, and the same logic in many cases is sort of working behind the scenes for uh, the ways that uh, church leaders are are thinking about those issues. So I wanted to kind of bring them all together. And um, yeah, it's a sort of, uh, you know, one, two, three punch there a little bit. It's uh, kind of hard sometimes, but it really is. And I have to tell you, sometimes it seems like when I talk about race issues, or if I talk about feminist issues, or if I talk about gay issues, people are like, "Why are you talking about this stuff?" This, this, but I'm like, "Cause it's fun to talk about, and I like to talk about it. And if you don't want to listen, you know, you can you can skip this one." But um, <laughs> I think these are all really important topics. Um, and so I was really surprised because I, you know, we've got the little, little rainbow here. I thought this was all going to be about you know LGBT issues, and it says sexuality and gender. Uh, in modern Mormonism, kind of as your subtitle. And so I was really pleasantly surprised because I have to tell you, um, the priesthood ban and racial issues is kind of one of my favorite topics. And so it was really cool because that's your, that's where, that's where you start out. So um, I'd love for you to kind of talk a little bit about the history of race in the LDS church um, and, uh, and how that kind of ties in with, with gay issues as well. Yeah. 
So the typical way that we have told the history of the, the priesthood ban has been primarily around sort of focusing on race as the exclusive category. But when you started, when I started looking at, at the conversations that were happening and what church leaders were saying about race in the 50s and 60s, I, I saw immediately that marriage was one of the big concerns. Why, why were they in favor of segregation? Why did they oppose civil rights? Why did they even have church policies that would prevent marriage in the temple? Because they were really concerned about interracial sex, right? They, they thought that mm -hmm. this was a big, a big problem. And we had this whole ideology about race and racialized groups, you know, that this group was destined to do this and this group was destined to do that. And they worried that interracial um, uh, uh, mixing would dilute the sort of divine designs for those particular races. Um, and so I, I immediately saw that the question of race was really entwined with the with questions of sexuality. And as of, again, as a sort of modern parallel to issues around uh, around um, same sex relationships today, I also wanted to show that that the question of who could marry who wasn't just an issue that we dealt with in polygamy. It was an issue that we dealt with in the 50s, 60s and 70s. And even up until the last decade, we still were publishing manuals that had quotes from Spencer W. Kimball discouraging interracial marriage. Right. So the, the question of of what kinds of who who can marry who what kinds of couples are allowed in the church uh you know uh, in some cases socially and in some cases ecclesiastically was not just an old question it was actually a pretty new question that we've dealt with and so i wanted to tell the history of how we kind of uh worked through that particular issue as a way as again sort of as a uh not not explicitly but a, but a parallel to the kinds of questions that we're dealing with same-sex relationships too yeah. So, so it was great. It was kind of, I was, I was really surprised to see how much detail you went into there. Um, can we talk a little bit more about some of the rhetoric around interracial marriage? What, what were some of the things said and how are they similar to some of the things said today? Yeah. So, uh, you know, m maybe there's something else that you're thinking of that, that if you want to prompt my memory about it, but, um, but uh, one of the discourses that they were using was about purity. And they were really thinking about racial purity as this value, as this good. And of course, that's rooted in the kind of white supremacist rhetoric, and and it's uh, based in kind of sort of hierarchical thinking as well. Um, that some races were sort of higher up on the hierarchy with with respect to God, and and of course, Latter Day Saints saw themselves as as the best and the purest of all of those, right? And we have this entire language about race that, for the most part, just doesn't exist today. I mean, if you look at something like the B1 campaign that was done in, in um, 2018 in celebration of the 40th anniversary of the uh, of the priesthood uh, revelation, um, you, you don't see you don't see appeals to sort of the racialized groups of different people and their destinies. And so all that stuff is just totally gone. Um, so so both the kinds of purity and this discourse about um, about just even that races had a sort of divine design that they were that they were given by God uh, uh, these different tasks. And that comes out of Southern um, uh, U U.S. Southern segregationist and North. So, of course, some northerners were, were segregationists as well. And obviously, Latter-day Saints were. Um, but this sort of segregationist thinking was also based on this idea that God created the races as these sort of discrete things and that um, it was our obligation to sort of preserve those discrete boundaries between between the races. Um, so that language then of hierarchy, the language of purity was also the same kind of language that they were using to talk about women's roles and and why it wasn't just about white supremacy, but also about patriarchy as well. And so we get this during the same time period, a lot of the language of the patriarchal order of marriage, you know, um, it's also a term that we just don't even hear anymore. But I grew up in the 90s hearing this, I, I felt like all the time that there was such a thing as the patriarchal order of marriage. Now you just won't find it in church manuals that hasn't been spoken in general conference in, in a long, long time. Um, and so, uh, but pa the patriarchal order was also based on this notion of a sort of pure, discrete boundaries between the sexes. 
and that if we undertook act activities that sort of blurred those boundaries or created instability between those boundaries, then we were also blurring God's will, just as we would be for the racial boundaries as well. So a lot of the same kinds of language, the same discourse about purity, around boundaries, around a hierarchy, uh, we see uh, as a kind of operating set of doctrinal underpinnings of a lot of the ways that church leaders were thinking about race, gender, and and certainly sexuality even today. Um, you know, we can we can make the same parallels about a hierarchy between hetero and homosexuality, uh, the purity of boundaries between those, and so on. That, that that kind of continues to influence the way that church leaders think about these things. Well, and it seems like marriage was a big issue, which is kind of funny because a lot of the the most uh, I don't, want to, I don't know if violence is the right word, but the, the most, the biggest opposition with Mormons in marriage, you know, first we were polygamous, we're, def we're defending polygamy, and then the U.S. government beat that out of us. And then um, when it comes to race issues, interracial marriage, I know um, uh, Peterson and McConkey and Joseph Fielding Smith had some real... Uh, fire and brimstone kind of speeches about we can't have interracial marriage it's it, it's messing up god's plan and and so it's interesting to me i kind of want to tie this into into feminism because it, it ties into that as well as into gay marriage and so it seems like mormons are really trying to regulate marriage that it's supposed to be whites only or blacks only or asians only and so could you talk a little bit more about how Mormons are trying to define marriage and, and if we do it wrong, it's going to bring the downfall of civilization? Yeah, we, we often end up on the wrong side of these issues, unfortunately, or at least in, in contemporary perspective, right? Um, the, the issues that we were, the kind of perspectives that we were defending a generation or two ago aren't, aren't necessarily the ones that we hold on anymore. But yeah, they, they had a whole theory that um, that civilization was sort of dependent on these hierarchies, right? Uh, that there was a kind of divinely imposed order of the races of 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 sexual hierarchy, as we mentioned, between men and women, and that to our peril, you know, we would undo all of those things um, and and risk our risk our own you know nation and risk our own um, uh, civilizational stability, and. You know, you can kind of understand this in the context of the Cold War, which is when many of these doctrines are really starting starting to be emphasized, and this rhetoric about national stability uh, is showing up because we're seeing the same thing happening in evangelical and and uh, uh, fundamentalist Protestant fundamentalist circles as well. This sort of emphasis on very rigid racial boundaries and, of course, uh, very rigid gender boundaries. Um, and these things get politicized later on with the with the religious right, which will which I'm sure we'll talk about at some point here. But um, uh, so Latter Day Saints sort of belong to this broader culture in the ways that they're thinking about these civilizational risks um, in uh, in undoing these hierarchies because the society is ordered a certain way, right? And if you reordered it in the way that the people who are arguing for racial integration or the, the feminists were arguing for. You know, then, of course, a certain group loses power and then it's going to be chaos and we're going to all fall to the communists or or something like that. Right. And um, and they looked to the com communism specifically, which had um, feminist elements to it. You know, women would go to work and they would say, look how terrible that society is. Therefore, you know, women going to work is a sign of communism. And and so we had the you had all these sort of larger anxieties, of course, about gender roles. But I wanted to also kind of place it in the context of a, a larger um, international story about uh, the way that Latter-day Saints were kind of thinking in term in nationalistic terms and in American civilizational terms of sort of pro-democracy, pro-Western in contrast to communism at the time, which they associated civil rights, they associated feminism with communism, and therefore, you know, they were those, these were the things that were going to end America as we knew it, right? Well, yeah, absolutely. So I, I think what was interesting to me is, especially in the 50s and 60s, the, the interracial marriage would, would bring about the downfall of civilization. And now, we have a black general authority, which was unheard of in the 50s and 60s. But this black, Peter Johnson is who I'm talking about. But he's he's married to a white woman, and we have an apostle. Mm -hmm. um, why am I not? Uh, Gong. Gong. Yeah. Elder Gong. Elder Gong. 
he's he's Asian and he has a white wife as well. So apparently we've 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 completely changed on on this issue about whether interracial marriage is a good thing. Um and I think you also mentioned Mia Love. She's a, she was a black congresswoman. Um and that and she has a white husband. So um so it, it, talk about how how we flipped from this is the downfall of civilization to totally embracing it now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there were there was so much anxiety around it. It's almost hard to fathom how much anxiety there was, you know, um, because it, and it wasn't just black white um, marriages that they were concerned about. Also, I, I go in to talk a lot about um, the Native American, uh, what was then called the Indian Placement Program, I oh, believe. That's right. Um, where uh, especially Navajo um, uh, children would be brought to northern U Utah. Uh, and, and other places and placed in white homes during the school year so that they could attend the public schools in the the north. And then they would go back to the to the Navajo reservation. And other tribes were involved in this Indian placement program as well. But of course, then what happens is, People fall in love, right? And you get uh, you get uh, uh, Native Americans and white people getting married, and all of a sudden the church starts freaking out about this. And Spencer W. Kimball, who had been a big advocate of the uh, Indian placement program, was out there as the biggest opponent of interracial marriage, right? And the same thing happens when we're setting up BYU Hawaii, uh, what, whatever it was called back then, uh, the Polynesian College or something. I forget exactly what its name was back then. Um, but same thing, you get you get sort of integration, social integration that leads to marriages and relationships. And the church is like, oh, this isn't what we meant, right? They, we wanted integration, but not intermarriage. Um, so, so there's a lot of anxiety about that. And it is surprising that and then what are we 40, 50 years later, now general authorities who were those who were that age of that age when they were hearing all of these messages of don't get married, <laughs> don't do go, don't be involved in interracial marriages. They ignored that advice, got married anyway, and now have become general authorities. So <laughs> I think that those are some really interesting ones. And the Mia Love one is uh, I found particularly interesting because it's not just the sort of uh, uh, racial boundaries that were being blurred in her case, but also she was, of course, working. She was a working mother and, and not only working in uh, 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 you know, a, a high demand job, but a high demand job that often took, took her out of state as well. And yet the church didn't seem to have any problem with it. They promoted her on the I'm a Mormon campaign. They, uh, um, you know, she, 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 there were newspaper articles in the Deseret News, uh, you know, talking about her and, and her relationship with her husband. And so I wanted to sort of trace that shift. Of how do we get to today where these things aren't problematic when they were to the to, to the members of the 50s and 60s? Yeah, if if you know Joseph Fielding Smith were around today and saw what the makeup of the uh, <laughs> you know of the general authorities and the kinds of marriages that they were in, how many children they had, did they use birth control? Yeah, definitely, right. All of those things he would be very confused by because he was such a vehement opponent of those uh, of those practices. So I wanted to understand again that these aren't, you know, it's not just the change from monogamy to polygamy. That's not the only big change that we've made with respect to marriage, and certainly not with respect to sexuality as well. It's much more recent than that that we've been in that we've been having this conversation inside of the church about who gets to marry who, and uh, and what are the rules around that, and uh, and so on. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Dr. Taylor Petrie. In our next conversation, we're going to move on to feminism. You know, the LDS Church was neutral towards the ERA amendment in the 1970s until they were approached by a Catholic woman named Phyllis Schlafly. So the church gets uh, uh, the church gets recruited to do this and reverses itself because at first it was saying no this is a political issue we don't comment on political issues we just care about you know moral issues not not political ones but the Phil Schlafly convinces the church that this is a moral issue that it's not just a political issue and so the church decides to mobilize its membership um, in in this political in this political fight and they start sending members to ERA conventions to shout down the leaders there and to sort of disrupt the meetings. If you'd like to hear the entire interview uncut, please subscribe to patreon.com slash gospel tangents. And for just $5 a month, you can hear the entire interview without any interruption. 
If you'd like a paperback version of our transcripts, go to Amazon.com and do a search for Gospel Tangents interview. Also, if you'd like to give the money to me and not Amazon, please subscribe on my website and I'll be able to send you a transcript as soon as they are completed and click the subscribe button. You can also find our latest information on Facebook.com slash Gospel Tangents, as well as we're on Twitter at Gospel Tangents. And don't forget to subscribe on Apple Podcasts. The link is at tinyurl.com slash Gospel Tangents, and you can subscribe there. Also, please give us a five-star review. If you want to support all of the podcasts as part of the Dialogue Podcast Network, Go to lyceum.fm, that's L-Y-C-E-U-M dot F-M, and do a search for Dialogue Podcast Network or Gospel Tangents, because, you know, that's a pretty cool one, too. Thanks again for listening. Click here to subscribe, here for a transcript, and over here we've got some of our great videos. Thanks again.